morning. My name is Jude, and I am the Director of Innovative Ministry at Grace Cathedral. I am honored to be sharing this important anniversary with all of you this morning. As I stand here among the trees, I am reminded of the cathedral where I serve, and I'm conscious that even as I speak, we are rededicating the AIDS Interfaith Chapel there. Two sacred stories, a grove and a cathedral, one written in stone and the other in wood. When you first walk into grace, your eyes are drawn up by the columns to the immense height of the ceiling above you. A deep memory resides in this grove, a sacred and a universal memory of a time before tree trunks inspired Gothic pillars. We have yet to create stained glass more stunning than even a single cluster of leaves transfigured by the midday sun into a million beautiful patchwork of glowing green glass. Any dillard ruminates that big trees stir memories. And so it makes good sense that this is where we remember those whom we love but see no longer and all those that care for them. But the memorial grove is more than a repository of remembrance. It is the living metaphor of this year's theme, bending the arc toward justice. It points us to our future in a decisive way. In our current political climate, Dr. King's words ring as true today as they did 50 years ago. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, tireless exertions, and passionate concerns of dedicated individuals, individuals like you. We find sanctuary here in refuge because we built them. The purpose of a sanctuary is not simply to extend a canopy of protection, it is also to nourish the taproot of our resolve so that when the violent winds of change rattle our branches, it seems these days one tree at a time, we may know of what we are made. And knowing this, stand firm in the unwavering truth of our dignity. In my tradition, we remember every week how love was betrayed in an olive grove and nailed to a tree by Rome's perverse wager that death was stronger than life only to discover that from their cross bloomed the resurrection hope that no empire could stamp out. We gather today to resist death in all its forms, even as we honor the dead. We're here because we refuse the temptation to seek refuge only here in this grove surrounded by these trees. We know that we are called to become that refuge until every broken corner of our world is renewed in hope. Take a deep breath. Come into this place. Be present now. Put down roots here for the next hour. Feel the power conducting through these trees. It's the same power that is coursing through your veins. Let your feet sink deep and your eyes lift high. Because God made you great. And for greatness, God made you. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Jude. Good afternoon. My name is Corey Pell McCoy. I'm on the board of directors for the National AIDS Memorial, co-chair of today's World AIDS Day event, and a man who's thriving with HIV. And hello. My name is Paris Lane, and I am on the board of directors for the National AIDS Memorial Road, and I am co-chairing this event. Chevron's unyielding dedication in fighting this epidemic continues in countries such as Angola, Nigeria, South Africa, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. This global organization is moved to honor with these beautiful quilts, those within their communities who were affected or infected by the epidemic around the world. On behalf of the National AIDS Memorial, we would like to sincerely thank Chevron for their deeply important partnership with our organization and for those that we serve. Today we are thrilled to be joined by former President Bill Clinton, who, along with Congresswoman and House 
House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi put the National AIDS Memorial into the landscape of national memorials with the National AIDS Memorial Grove Act of 1996. We are so deeply grateful.
In the United States, there are over 1.2 million people living with HIV. And within that number, the CDC estimates that one in seven of those people do not know they are infected. That means that there are still far too many people who have not been diagnosed and are not receiving the treatment so that they can live long and healthy lives. We are all here today to raise awareness and to help make a difference by providing support for those living with HIV and by making sure that the number of new infections gets lower and lower every year, getting to zero. That starts with awareness and it starts with testing. At Quest Diagnostics, we have a goal of enabling people to take action from insights. We can only take action needed to help ourselves in our communities if we understand our health, if people are educated and empowered by knowing their status. As a leading provider of diagnostic information services, Quest Diagnostics is dedicated to advancing disease management for the HIV community and raising the standards of care for HIV diagnosis. The important work to promote HIV testing and care and to raise awareness does not end after World AIDS Day. It does not end today. It continues and ensues. We need to continue to educate the community about the need for HIV screening and care, that we can work together to improve the health of individuals and their individual health care. We need to continue to empower individuals to work with their health care providers when it comes to their health. And on behalf of Quest Diagnostics, thank you again for being part of this important mission. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Quest Diagnostics. Today we gather here in this sacred space to remember all lives lost and to honor all those living with HIV and AIDS. My name is John Cunningham. I'm the Executive Director of the National AIDS Memorial.
created by individuals with a shared vision to create a space for those seeking healing, hope, and remembrance. Today it is my honor to introduce a longtime supporter and partner of the memorial. Mark Buell is a native San Franciscan. Mark holds a deep commitment to San Francisco values and a commitment to San Francisco and all it stands for. Mark has a long commitment to San Francisco's cherished parks and green spaces. He has served on numerous boards, including the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy and is president of the Marin Community Foundation. Mark is president of the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Commission, the body which oversees our public-private partnership. And this partnership with the city and county of San Francisco is indeed a model for our nation, and we are so proud and so honored that we had entered into this partnership 26 years ago. Please help me welcome to the stage, Mark Buell.
Perhaps some of his greatest work began when he left office and created both the Clinton Global Initiative and established the Clinton Foundation, where he devoted much of his time working both in the United States and around the world, helping bring economic opportunity, fight AIDS, increase education, and help resolve racial and religious differences. Sadly, much of his participation was curtailed because of his own ethical desire not to create even a hint of conflict of interest during Hillary's recent campaign. I know this has proved very hard for the president. For someone with such an enormous energy, intellect, curiosity, and drive, work, hard work, is his reward. I remember last year before the election, we were finishing a round of golf here at Harding Park, a Rabbit Park facility. <laughs> and, and before we said goodbye, he looked at me and he said, all I want to do is go back to work. I think we can all agree and can only hope that circumstances will now allow that to become a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. changed remarkably over nearly 50 years now. And then I spent 
a lot of time walking through every nook and cranny of Berkeley. But mostly I just hoofed it around San Francisco. I have walked more miles in this city than many lifetime residents. But my favorite place to be was Golden Gate Park. And I still remember, I was telling Mark, I still remember that St. Francis Hotel had a doorman who was in 111 years old and still jogged across the park to work every day. And I thought that's what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I'm going to check out at 112 when I'm jogging across the <laughs> Golden Gate Park. So, thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you for your leadership. I want to thank Mike Shriver and John Cunningham. <laughs> in China when we were the first. <laughs> but you know, this guy's been working since the early 80s on this. He had high-ranking positions in our government and, uh, and in subsequent administrations because they knew that he both knew what he was talking about <laughs> and he'd given his life, his professional life to do this. 
So I'm grateful for his leadership of PEP4 and so much else. But today, I want to say the thing I'm most grateful for, because people are, it's easy to, for some of us at least to get down reading the news every day. You must always remember, it's okay to react to the news. It's okay to be high when it's not good. It's okay to be low when it's bad. But don't forget, there's sometimes a difference between the headlines and the trend lines. When this mayor took office, the headlines for San Francisco were terrible. But the trend lines were good. Why? Because it's a remarkable collection of communities uh, where diversity is viewed as a strength, not a weakness. And where... <laughs> racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, all the cultural issues. It, it's economically, it's educationally diverse. It's, it's, it's a cauldron out of which you can make beautiful things happen if you believe that what we have in, more in common is more important than our interesting differences. If you believe that cooperation works better than endless conflict. If you'd rather help somebody else make something good happen and feel like you're lifted up by it, and beat the living daylights out of somebody else because it makes you feel momentarily strong. And so, we do that. So what looked like a thankless job looked pretty good today, doesn't it? <laughs> I, uh, so here's what I want to say. Think about the headlines, but don't forget the trend lines. Because how our children and grandchildren will live is more determined by the trend lines than the headlines. <laughs> Assuming we act with our heads on straight and our hearts in good order. So the theme of this World Day today is bending the art for justice, which is a of course, a uh, reference to Martin Luther King's noble phrase that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Consider the AIDS epidemic. In the early AIDS, as I said, people were afraid. They were hurting. They were helpless. We had this amazing situation in Arkansas where our largest county had two gay men as chairman of the Republican and Democratic parties. <laughs> and nobody said anything. <laughs> and, and they were both friends of mine. Back then, you could actually be friends with somebody in the other party and nobody looked at you. They look at you like you've got an incurable disease. <laughs> and the Democrat, to whom I have felt a very close bond for many years, was the one who got AIDS. And I'll never forget standing in that hospital room in the early 80s, looking at it covered in the black sores of Kaposi sarcoma. And I realized that we were all just sitting there on watch. There was not one single solitary thing anybody could do except to give aid and comfort to those who loved them and to him. There were no antiretrovirals, and he died shortly after our last visit. We had, Hillary and I did a lot of friends like that, including a man who worked with her when she was chairman of the Board of the Legal Services Corporation. Now, the fight to bend the arc toward justice began here in San Francisco.
so many were suffering, so many were dying, that ordinary people came together to work together to fight against fear and stigma, to deal with the unknowns. And medical professionals decided they would know more if they threw themselves into it, both the researchers and the practitioners. And Eric started his first aid clinic. And the only other place where people were dealing with it in an, was New York in an open way at the time. And Haiti, where a man named Bill Pep started about the time you did, to be joined a few years later by Paul Farmer. So the ark was bending. In the 90s, the movement picked up steam because the antiretrovirals developed, saved all these people. I remember when I ran for president, I was at a rally in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I came up to a white lady holding an African-American baby. And I said, where'd you get the baby? She said, that's my baby. She was born HIV positive in Miami. And I'm determined to keep her alive. She adopted this baby. She's about 26 years old now. And, uh, she's a beautiful woman. And then the NIH started doing all this research, and we were trying to pump money into it. And she got in one of the research protocols. And they would come and see me as she grew up as a little girl. And I'd bring them to the White House so I could keep a human face on this. And now every time I go to Iowa, if I'm in 50 or 60 miles of where she is, she comes to see me. The ark was bending. Then in 1996, I was asked to sign this bill. They created this place. And I was honored to do it, but there are people here today on this board or co-sponsoring this event who hatched this idea in 1988, when America was still in the dark. So I thank all of you. 1988, unless my math fails, that's 29 years. Soon be 30. But the art was bending. Then this new century started. And oh my God, all the good things that have happened. There were big headlines about the creation of the Global Fund on HTV Malaria, which we laid the foundation for when I was president, got the UN to go along and it was funded and set up afterward. The President Bush 43 passed up for. The French came up with this unbelievable idea called Unite that put all the tax on every international flight into and out of France, which has been used to buy the best and least expensive pediatric AIDS medicine and second and third line AIDS medicines. And the Gates Foundation got in a big way. The British government got in in a big way. The governments of many other countries in Europe helped us to get started. And underneath, there were all these NGOs working, doctors without borders, partners in health, the Clinton Foundation. We worked to negotiate dramatically cheaper prices. And when we started in 2002, when there was no global fund and no PEMFAR, Nelson Mandela and I were on, we were both out of office and we were all dressed up and needed something to do. <laughs> they asked us to, uh, they asked us to, to be part of a group that would go around and basically rattle a tin cup and plead with other governments to give us money to fight AIDS. 
And uh, so Barcelona hosted the, the AIDS conference, the International AIDS conference then. And the, the chairman of the effort in the Caribbean against HIV and AIDS was a man named Denzel Douglas, who was a physician and the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. And he came up to me and he said, look, he said, I know what the problems are in the other world, the rest of the world. He said, we don't have a discrimination problem. We don't have a stigma problem in the Caribbean. But we do have the second fastest growing epidemic in the world. And what we have is a money problem and an organization problem. And I said, well, Denzel, what do you want me to do about it? Mandela's sitting there just laughing. He said, yeah, I think like I walked into a buzzsaw. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, I want you to fix it. <laughs> so that's all there was to this conversation. I was just like, I said, okay. <laughs> Little, and I hadn't a clue what would happen. But I knew that the only place in the Caribbean rich enough to take care of its AIDS load was the place with then, the second or third highest number of AIDS patients, the Bahamas. The epidemic started in Haiti and spread to the Dominican Republic, spread to the Bahamas. They were treating a few hundred people, but they were paying $3,500. This is how disorganized the market was. $3,500 a year for generic drugs that you could buy if you could get to India for 500. So I thought this is going to be easy. <laughs> they just had two middle, two, two middle men who were ripping the system off. So four days after we started, we got the price $500. And they could, even with the extra care costs, handle both basically six times as many people for the same amount of money. So I thought, oh, this is going to be a snap. <laughs> but slowly but surely, we got the prices down, $500, 250 190 still on three pills a day, all the way down to 90 Children's medicine, because it was smaller in volume, the demand went from $600 down to 60 And... Uh, then we realized we had to do something special about mother-child transition, transition, and we had to get the testing equipment down. We had to give faster test results to people in remote areas and do all that, so we worked on that. Anyway, one thing led to another, and the art kept doing it. Finally, we had Death rates going down. And then finally now, we can say for the first time that of all the people with HIV in the world, there are more people on medication than not. <laughs> then we realized that we didn't have anybody to give it to in a lot of places. In Ethiopia, when we went to work there, there were 88 million people. 60% of them lived in 60,000 villages with fewer than 1,000 people. So if we could basically have taken this whole crowd and flown to Addis Ababa on an airplane, and we all got food poisoning. We land at the airport, we would be fine. The head of the World Health Organization now, Mr. Tedros, is in the health minister of Ethiopia. And I have a very high regard for him, but would have suited me to make him Secretary of Health and Human Services. He was good where he could be good. But all those people out there, they were living and dying anonymously. And not just of AIDS. The same thing was true in rural China, where the epidemic in the cities was basically had your typical AIDS causes of 
epidemic in the country because people were starving and they were dying from contaminated needles and bad blood transfusions when Eric went there. And they were dying anonymously. So they said, well, we can't do this. It's just lower the cost of medicine. The same thing we're doing that, by the way, with, in a much less hostile terrain with the opioid epidemic today. We're facing many similar ch ch charges. I mean, challenges, but so we started building clinics. And we asked the Ethiopian, well, how many clinics do you need for everybody to be within a day's walk of one? And uh, at the time, in the whole country, in the whole country, in the 60,000 villages, there were 700 clinics. I mean, and we're not talking, we're talking about little bitty rooms in an outhouse. Most of them didn't even have a way to maintain a cold chain. So they said 3,500. So we said, okay, we'll do that. And then I said, how many to be within three hours? Well, 16,000. And we never got there because all the money ran out. Now it's being resumed. But the ark was bending. And it was bending because all kinds of people were doing all kinds of things. I appreciated what Mark said about the work we tried to do in doubling the NIH budget and, and the CARE budget, the Ron and White budget. That would be the first conference on aid. It all seems so little now. Having the Justice Department prosecute anybody that we could find who was discriminating against their employees on the basis of their status. Having Dick Holbrook work at the UN to require the Security Council to declare aid a threat to our security. It seems so little now because the ark has been bit there. So, today, this year, we now have a low-cost generic drug that costs $75 a year in one pill with fewer side effects. It acts faster. It can be given to more people than we now know. Most people believe that we should be putting people on treatment immediately. It encourages people to get tested. It encourages greater adherence because they don't get sick. It's not as good as a foolproof vaccine or nowhere as good as a cure. But if you look at what's happened with hepatitis C, which I never thought I would see, there are enough similarities. But before we jump out and enjoy enough differences to be skeptical, but there are enough similarities to make us believe that we might actually see a cure. No one could ever have invented that who understood the basic biology and science before just a few years ago. So the ark has been Do we have problems? Yes. There's still 36 million people plus who are HIV positive. More than a million in the United States still. 30% don't know they're infected. In the U.S., 15% don't. And the problem with that, as we all know, is that your greatest chance of passing on the virus is in the first few months. We've got a number of challenges. But I just carried around that first article on the hepatitis C medication. I just carried her around with me for weeks. I think all the young people that work with me think I'm becoming a creaky old man. I can't carry this. And I probably am. But the point is, the arc is bending. And it's important. So, what have we learned about all this art bending? The 
it gets bent by people. Not just the researchers, not just the doctors, not just the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation or even more important, PEP foreign aid and the UN and all that. It is bent by people. And the people who bend it are people who believe that our common humanity is more important than our interesting differences. The, uh, I'm telling you, I know that you, some of you get agitated when you live through our daily whatever today. <laughs> But you have to understand, this is just the latest, largest example of what promises to be a long struggle to define the terms of our interdependence within the United States and globally. We do live in the most interdependent age in human history. We can't escape each other. You build all the walls you want. We'll kind of it won't keep weapons out, it won't keep technology out. The social media is going to still drive you nuts. <laughs> right? We are interdependent. It is for us to decide what the implications that are, to set the terms of our interdependence. Anybody who promises that they can make it go away is not telling you the truth. So will we believe in an inclusive interdependence or an exclusive one? Do we believe that there is a fixed economic, social, and cultural pie, so we all have to fight to get a bigger piece for our crowd? Or do we believe when we work together, we can make it better for everybody? Do we believe that things are so desperate, we have to just get everything we can today without regard to the consequences to the next generation, or do we believe we cannot be fully human unless, like every other living species on Earth, we take account in everything we do of the ability of our whole species to survive, which is a clinical way of saying we care about what happens to our children, grandchildren, and generation children. <laughs> Inclusion, not division. I choose cooperation, not conflict. I think addition and multiplication are better than subtraction and division. If we get the big things right, then we can keep them in the arm. And there's still many to do. Most of you are like me. You, there's no way I can ever actually develop a cure for AIDS. But we can remain steadfast in opposing discriminatory policies that are yeah. making a comeback in some African countries. <laughs> we can protect activists in places where they still can be subject to violence. We can reduce in the United States the disparities that the epidemic still reaches, especially among gay men of color. And we can continue to fight the homophobia, racism, and poverty that make people more vulnerable to infection. <laughs> but even though I am still an unabashed and unashamed policy wonk, and it's very out of fashion today, I used, to, I used to tell people, I was in the only, for 25 plus years, I was in the only business you can imagine where people were surprised if you knew anything. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? I mean, knowing things, that's what you got hired help for. I don't believe that. But I do believe knowing it's the whole dilemma of the fox and the hedgehog. The hedgehog knows many things, the fox knows one big thing. 
If all you know is one big thing and you're wrong, everybody is in a heck of trouble. But you must also be able to take all the little things you know and paint a big picture with it. So I ask you, finally, not to give up on anybody. One of the most amazing things to me, and I'll never forget it, was in his last year in the Senate, Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms said his one regret was that he hadn't done more to combat AIDS. And he supported PEPFAR in the scale of our efforts. I used to keep a scripture verse from my faith on my desk when I was a governor. Where St. Paul said, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap we don't lose heart. So you honor people today who never lost heart. There has never been a better time for us to adopt Martin Luther King's message at a time of widespread cynicism and resentment and loss of belief that the arc of the universe is long, the moral arc, but it does bend toward justice. It does, but you've got to do the bending. And you've got to be willing to live with a few curves in the bend. The trend lines are good. This garden will give people peace, reflection, and memory. But only those of us who remain can do the bending. Thank you.
the 2017 Tom Wayne Unsung Hero, Ruth Kokerberg.
Francisco model that Paul Overdeen is here in the room. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, many of the many of the many of the uh, people who came together at that time were in this room, and too many to name. But I would say. person in Chevron, from my perspective, who engaged that dialogue, brought his leadership along to realize that this was a moment that talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. David took his uh, vision uh, and worked early on in also acknowledging the movement and the impact that HIV has had globally. Uh, and because of the multinational took that as an opportunity to respond to, again, employees in their organization uh, who were, in fact, affected by HIV, but also opened the doors up uh, to the community around uh, those efforts for the employees, again, an exemplary moment. The work in Nigeria, the PMPCP program, the work in Southeast Asia, uh, Angola, David was also the centerpiece of the discussion internally in Chevron, but also externally in seeing an opportunity at the Global Fund for HIV, TB, and malaria to be the first and largest, as it stands, corporate sponsor and supporter of that for years now. Uh, 2002, when it opened, uh, an interest, and then as the uh, footprint from the Global Fund became more solid, saw an opportunity to support uh, in a millions of dollars type contribution uh, that went for many years. I really think David exemplifies uh, the talk is cheap, actions speak louder than words aspect of everybody in this room. He is personally, internally motivated and has made a contribution that we can be proud of and that I am proud to highlight with this award.
Chevron leadership in the explosive sector to Ed Rose and our former vice chairman, Peter Walker. I share this award with hundreds of Chevron employees who have fought beside for over 30 years in the Houston industry. Mm -hmm. And the many volunteers who stitched together this year's report. We have up to 50 members with our hard work. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to share the reward for the team that has been by my side for the past two half decades. And if you wouldn't mind standing up, this is going to be great. Jesse from the Sierra Wind Northwest. Ernesto de la Torre. <laughs> Carol McCauley. <laughs> and last but not least, Dr. Omar Abbasi. <laughs> Thank you for this award that has touched my heart.
continuing to educate young people about HIV and AIDS. And when he got very sick after the series finished shooting, he again showed leadership when he insisted we keep filming and sharing his story until his last breath. Because until that last breath, he was a person living with AIDS, not dying from AIDS. MTV's viewers, Pedro showed tremendous leadership in humanizing the disease and educating a generation of young people about the need to practice safe and responsible sex. And as President Clinton said shortly after Pedro's death, he did more, he did that more effectively than any public service announcement the government could produce. So looking back on Pedro and what he accomplished in his short lifetime, I, ex I am excited that the National AIDS Memorial Grove has chosen to name its Young Leaders Scholarship Program after my friend, Pedro Zamora. And I am excited about the scholarship's potential to help grow the next generation of young leaders. Thank you.
It's not just altruism that guides us in maintaining the scholarship program. It's self-interest. If we really want to change the trajectory of this epidemic, if we're really trying to get to zero, we need these young people to be both the boots on the ground and the ones calling the shots. This scholarship's not about supporting the leaders of tomorrow. It's about what we need to do to move the needle and bend the art today. These emerging leaders aren't just our hope for the future. They're the ones creating change right now. You're going to hear from three of our Peters Moore scholars today. Before I introduce them, I want to acknowledge the other men on the stage with me right now. Mario Diaz, who is a longtime friend of the program, and former board member, um, and, um, uh, and, and a member of our scholarship select committee as well. He, here representing Wells Fargo. And David Gunkowski, representing Gilead Sciences. Both of these organizations played a vital role in fighting AIDS of the North Force alongside this member. And as sponsors of the Peters Memorial Young Leaders Scholarship, they provide the partnership support and funding which make it possible. We all owe each other. And now it's my great privilege to introduce to you our first speaker, Kuan J. Fergasa. Kuan is a junior at Stanford University, majoring in applied mathematics with a public policy minor. As a high school student in Toronto, Kuan logged over 2,500 hours by, and this is a partial list, peer counseling and the offering sexual health education for the Tamil community and medical centers, facilitating workshops on anti aggression and conducting research on LGBTQ youth homelessness and suicide prevention. At Stanford, Kuan has continued their efforts the by serving as an HIV test counselor, developing educational resources for nonprofit and medical professionals to better serve queer patients, and engaging in community based research on HIV AIDS and LGBTQ health disparities, particularly among queer and trans people of color. After graduation, Kuan was to her master's degree in public policy using technology and data science to inform their future work. Ladies and gentlemen, well, thank you so much for the applause. Um, before starting, I would like to thank the National AIDS Memorial for all the wonderful work that you do and especially for supporting and encouraging our student activists financially so that we can pursue social justice through the Peter Rosa Moore Scholarship. And finally, thank you to everyone in the audience. It is so heartwarming to see all of you here in support of the Worthy Cause. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I'd like to add that King himself threw this quote from an 1853 sermon by Theodore Parker, a slavery abolitionist minister and an intellectual force in the most powerful social movement in America's history. I bring this up because all injustice is linked, and to properly advocate for one cause requires doing work and advocating for all marginalized groups around the world. HIV and AIDS. HIV AIDS is not just a gay or LGBT issue or an American issue. And being an advocate means eradicating poverty globally, as over 60% of HIV cases are in Sub Saharan Africa. It means fighting racism, as Black and Latinx HIV rates are eight and three times that of white Americans. It means pushing for trans justice because it is estimated that over one in five trans women are living with HIV in the US today. And it means so much more. I got involved in HIV AIDS activism for my involvement in queer advocacy and education and community service in Toronto through volunteering, teaching, and peer counseling. And I'd like to note that queer was originally a pejorative term in the community and used as a slur, but now many young members and old of the LGBT community willingly and pridefully embrace that term to identify themselves. And that just goes to show
And just goes to show how far that arc has been so far. And I realized through my activism that shame is often a disguise for internalized oppression. There is nothing inherently wrong with living with HIV, with being poor, for the color of your skin, for being a feminist, for who we love and how we love them. But society tells us, through direct and indirect messaging, that these are things to be disgusted by, to fear, and to hide. And realizing this has been so empowering for me and is what made me want to advocate for others so that they wouldn't feel the same unfounded shame that I felt when dealing with my sexual and gender orientations. As an activist, I practice effective altruism, meaning that I try to maximize my positive impact in this world. This means donating to, most, to the most effective causes and charities and doing work addressing the most important causes. And on this note, I'd like to end with a call to action. Whoever you are and whatever you do, you are uniquely situated to be addressing the cause in a particular way. Making the medical institution more LGBT friendly and sex positive, changing legislation to increase accessibility to HIV treatment and healthcare and to decriminalize HIV, creating educational and sex positive technology and media, and finally donating to organizations and causes that are already doing this work. The arc of the moral universe will keep bending, but only if we keep pushing it. Thank you. recipient, Kelly Gluckman, and just to give you a highlight of her uh, extensive commitment to date, she's so young, but she's accomplished so much. Uh, she's fourth year student at UCLA, majoring in world arts and culture with focus in arts activism. She's active in campus organizations that provide peer health and sexuality education to college students and at-risk high school students, has advocated for the rights of people living with HIV on Capitol Hill, written for online publications, and been featured in a national ad campaign by the CDC, as well as Dr. Rich's special on MTV. She is currently an official ambassador for the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. Now, after UCLA, she's still going to go on to higher education to pursue a master's degree in public health. It is her intent to work towards changing policy in the US to make sexual health education more inclusive, sex positive, and effective in empowering the nation's youth through their coming of age years. With gratitude, I introduce you to Kelly Blackman. I can't even tell you how excited and honored I am to be up here among such greats and standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I've been living with HIV for seven years. <clears throat> One of the ways I coped with the devastation of diagnosis was to talk to the people around me about what I was going through. And I learned that people are extremely uneducated about this, especially young people, and especially straight people. Straight people. <laughs> My friends would go get tested after hearing what I would go through. They'd analyze their own behavior and realize that they put themselves at risk. And when they heard my story, it really brought it home that this virus does not discriminate. I don't fit the stereotype of what someone um, might think someone looks like HIV would look like. I understand that in the world that we live in right now, I'm in a position to be heard by audiences who might not have listened otherwise. I felt called by this work. And then one day, I literally got a call. It was from uh, the woman who does the insurance billing at the LGBT Center in West Hollywood where I get um, my clinical services. Shout out to Janesta. Um, she told me that the CDC is looking for, for people to share their story for a national ad campaign. 
and she asked me if I'd be interested, and I didn't hesitate, I said yes. Um, from there, I started taking every opportunity that came my way to tell my story and to advocate for my community. One door after another opened, and I just continued walking through them. Eventually, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation found me, and I am so honored to carry on in her name. Yeah. Elizabeth Taylor was amazing. And through the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, I actually found the UCLA Sex Squad. Um, the Sex Squad, is, I know it's a funny name. Um, <laughs> the Sex Squad is a group of undergrads. We put together a theater production around the topics of sexual health and we perform at high schools. And really what we do is we just tell our stories um, through poetry, through dance, through theater. We, we do basically what Pages and Laura did, is just talk frankly with students and tell our stories and become vulnerable. And um, with every single day, I become more passionate about my work and frankly, more angry at the stigma that people who live with HIV still live with. I let it fuel me. I let my anger fuel me in my work because stigma is only a lack of understanding and education. I tell my story not only to educate others about using protection and getting tested, but also because I want to break through the stigma that is still so thick and complex and insidious. And it prevents so many people in my community from feeling worthy of living as whole beings in society. Regardless of how we look, where we come from, or how we got this, we who are living with HIV are worthy. My work at UCLA has enabled me to dig deeper in my work and to evolve as a performer, an artist, an educator, and an activist. Before I was diagnosed, I always said that I wanted to find something that I'm so passionate about that I want to work at until I die and I found it. And until sex and stigma aren't a thing, I'm gonna be doing it, and I'm gonna be fighting. Yeah. And I'm gonna carry on the torch that Pedro Zamora and so many others lit before. Thank you. Justice defines the exact reason why I'm 
am standing here today. As a development scholar, I have observed the healthcare field as a tool, as a tool which serves a purpose for healthier living. With scientific advances and interdisciplinary development, we as a nation progress. Then I continue to study through my academic courses and outside readings the consistent act of exploitation of the black community and communities of color, such as a lack of HIV testing, treatment, civil rights for people living with HIV, increased insurance premium, along with uh, pharmaceutical prices. See, see, I concluded that healthcare doesn't serve people like me, not the current philosophy of health for that matter. The history of health has shown a consistent act of um, brutality, rather including physical, mental, institutional, or financial on communities of color. Therefore, I became involved in the decision making to help reform the ideologies to enter the healthcare field. I became proactive at my institution, Tupelo College, by majoring in biology and minoring in chemistry to pursue the field of medicine. While studying, I also created a student-led organization to help redefine the philosophy of health, named Peer Health Educators. Health is represented as helping, educating, advising, learning, teaching, and healing. As an organization, we advocate and implement solutions such as HIV testing, opioid overdose testing, recycling programs, mobile apps related to sexual health, and segments pertaining to discourses on policy making that govern communities of color. As a development scholar, I am taking on a quest to seek for knowledge to mobilize a statement along with a movement to emphasize the importance of black scholars in the healthcare field. <laughs> to help develop fundamental components to improve communities, I have made a vow to continue fostering my ability to change the healthcare field by specializing in infectious diseases studying public health along with policy making to help build health clinics, hospitals, funding, and resources for people of color. I have witnessed injustice in the healthcare field, therefore I started creating pathways to decolonize institutional racism to help bend the arch. Thank you all. to the public. 
public landscape, creating grassroots organizations for support and activism, challenging injustices, bending the arc. Thus, three years ago, we partnered with York Locally and the HIV Story Project for the Surviving Voices video series. Following a healing focus first on the leather community and last year on hemophilia, the committee this year elected to shine our light on women. Francisco in 1982 and would regularly go to gay events and friends of ours were getting sick. And there were so many women who came to help, nurses, physicians, social workers, volunteers, mothers, family members, sisters. There was no end to the help that flooded in. We had sort of naively thought, and this was way back, that HIV was only going to affect certain people. A lot of people believed for a long time that women could not become infected with HIV. I was not at all thinking that I was somebody who needed to worry about HIV. I did all the surveys in the, in the newspaper, like, are you at risk if you have more than four partners? And I'm like, oh, that's not me. I was diagnosed with HIV 
when my husband was hospitalized in 1995 after the breakup with my my partner one of the things that he said was i've got aids so now so do you i was diagnosed while incarcerated and the doctor's dressed up like he just came out of surgery mask over his face his feet his hands arrange your affairs figure out who's going to raise your son for you um you're going to die it wasn't you have hiv it's you have aids and you're going to die he told me not to share the information with anybody because if I did, nobody would want to be associated with me. It was challenging because I talked to the priest at my church and he told me I was a sinner and he was damned. I told people at work and I was fired and having the whole company being told that if they ever came out positive that, you know, who they could sue was me. My sexuality was kind of taken away from me. The d HIV diagnosis kind of like made me die inside a little bit. And for me, the solution was to use drugs. I sort of like went into this suicide mission. So I was diagnosed in 94. It wasn't until 2002 that I attended my very first support group. And I can remember walking into the support group and sitting down and thinking, I have nothing in common with these women. And one lady started sharing. And at first I was kind of like slumped in a chair and then I sat up because she was telling my story. And then another lady told my story. And then another lady. And then I opened up. A lot of us were just staring and crying and hugging and couldn't believe we finally found other people who shared our experiences. Here in the US, women with HIV are living at the intersection of multiple oppressions. We live in a sexist patriarchal society. About 80% of women living with HIV are women of color, which means they're also impacted by racism. Not to say that Women are being impacted everywhere, but there's a huge impact in the southern regions of the United States of women living with HIV. We have all of those ingredients that, that impact you as far as HIV. Poverty, lack of education, mass incarceration, sexism, racism, misogyny. Some of us have been molested, some have been raped. We've all experienced trauma. We've all experienced some kind of violence in our life. For women of trans experience, they're also living with transphobia, which often can lead to violence, in some cases, deadly violence. 30% of women living with HIV in the U.S. have diagnosable PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what veterans come home from war with. Much of that is about living in a society that is actually violent towards them. Growing up, I um, had been assaulted and didn't uh, actually even share with my family about it, so I didn't have a chance to heal or to learn healthy boundaries and values around intimate partner violence. I was young, I was dating. Negotiating uh, condom use was not even a part of my thinking. A male condom means that your male partner has to know that it's being used, consent to using it, agree not to slip it off at some point. You know, there are a whole bunch of decision points that are not really within the context of a woman's control. In the early days, women living with HIV were largely ignored. We're not receiving AIDS diagnoses. We didn't have any clue about what the CDC knew about women. Literally none of the medications had been tried, had been tested for women to see how women would respond. Women's bodies are different. Our lives are different. Just to be a parent, worrying about whether your life is going to be extended long enough to watch your kids grow up. And you're so busy trying to take care of the family that sometimes you neglect yourself. Women who are diagnosed young may be thinking about how to create families, whether bearing children is an option, what they need to consider. When the test counselor told me that my test was positive, the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to have a baby. There has been absolutely a lot of talk about and a lot of stigmatization around women who are HIV infected, whether they should have children or not. Many, many, many women had their reproductive rights violated with misinformation, with stigma, with coercion. There's no problem in, in a woman wanting to be pregnant and just being a little more careful about taking antiretrovirals and um, keeping that baby unaffected, absolutely. I had my daughters, Sophia and Sarah, in March 1996. They were both born HIV negative, healthy, happy. I had my kids on my own terms. That is what one thing this, this movement has done, is to question every line that's been put in front of us. 
ACTA Caucus of Women. It was a bunch of women from across the country. It was some strong activist women, you know, who really, you know, had some insight. There was a sense in the room that these were people who were changing the world, people becoming experts on their own life, their own body, learning how to read clinical trials. And they told me that the, that the person was political. Yeah, and so these are the kind of things that um, just sparked my activism. This is like my dream job, but I was always afraid of kind of um, being in a leadership position. You know, I think a lot of us were raised with um, it's better to be seen than heard. And we, we just decided that we were not going to be at the um, bottom of the totem pole. We are leaders. We want to help shape the narrative around women living with HIV. Women with HIV are leading some of the most innovative, intersectional, and fiercest advocacy happening. Crafting policies, developing their state AIDS plans, and having formal, structured leadership roles within organizations and institutions. You know, not one more. We don't want one more woman to acquire HIV. I'm fighting. I'm fighting for those that have to come behind me. I'm fighting for those that will always be silent and never find their voice, and I'm fighting for me. For this epidemic, men open the door. But what I'm clear about is that it will be the women who close the door on this epidemic. Because once women close it, we change it. And when we change it, we change it. Change it. Change it. Change it. Women living in the geographic south and rural areas, 
experiencing housing instability, poor economic future, who are possibly out of care, taking care of a child or an elder, or usually both. These women deserve more than being honored. They deserve to survive and thrive. While there are many reasons to celebrate the strides and successes that have taken place in the HIV AIDS landscape, we can and must do better to prioritize women in our efforts to address outreach, advocacy, support, and funding for HIV research. So we ask, what will you do today for these women? We challenge you to bend the arc towards economic, racial, and gender justice. Dream big. Because we are changing things for everyone. And we, and we can certainly use your help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what a program it's been. I'm Joe Garrett. I'm the Deputy Director here at the National Lays Memorial. I want to thank you all again for your support and for being here today. Uh, we could not have done it without you, and we could not have done it without our sponsors. I want to reach out particularly and acknowledge Quest and Chevron and Jillian for their incredible support and help. As you've seen today, millions of people worldwide continue to be affected by AIDS and affected by HIV. You've also seen how people continue to rise to the occasion. Darkness does give way to light. The Grove is a community, a catalyst, a sacred space. But as I've been learning, it's also a state of mind. It's when we choose tolerance over hate kindness over love, goodness over bullying, generosity over elitism. The state of the mind at the Grove is that we include everyone. Let's all help bend the moral arc towards justice. Let's hasten it, let's nurture it, and never get in to less than our best selves, to those selves we are meant to be. Thank you again, everyone, for being here today. Peter Anza, Peter J. Shaw, Peter Swarkowski, Fred Lawton, Randy Funninger, JD, Randy Fulton Jones, Raymond Lee Benson, Reggie Burns, Renee Paper, Rick Again, Ginger Brulai, Rich Davis, Rich Bogle, Richard C. Nagler, Richard Haney, Richard James, PhD, Richard John Maynard, Richard Muro, Richard Ruggiero and Michael Kerris, Richard Tuberdyke. Rick Emerson and Steve Emerson. Rick Latulipe. Ricky Robert and Randy Ray. Rita Rocket. Robert Granberg. Robert Leo K. Smith. Robert Bucket. Robert Price. Robert Rogitsky. Ron Stefanik. Ronald John Callahan, Ronald Shoma, Rose Kreider, Roy H. Schmidt, Rudy Ochoa, Ruth Coker Burks, Ryan White, Scott A. Anderson, Scott Edward Blomquist, 
Scott G. Munger, Sean E. Cobb, Seifert Family, Shaikh Gregorian, PhD, Shannon Penberthy, Shelby Detrick, MD, Stephen Gray Keel, Stephen J. McKenna, Stephen Kulingaski, Steve Abbott, Steve Gilbertson, Stephen A. Marvin. Stephen Blackledge, Stephen E. Reasonfeld, Susan Karp, Terry L. Stodgedell, and Sue G. O'Leary, Thomas Oxley, Thomas J. Fahey, Jr., Tian Gudong, Tim Haas, Timothy S. Bridgers, Timothy Sean Carroll, Timothy W. Andrews, Todd Smith, Tommy Godkin, Tommy Kepfenstein, Tony Maynard, Trilby Kong de Grande, Walter Parsley, Will Demers, William Lee McCoy, William McCartney, William Rottenberry. Those are the names of the individuals. Over here in the crescent circles, new engravings, there are two of them. The first one reads, Roger William Slight and Mark Charles Backer wish you deep peace. The other one reads, Dr. Marcus Conant, a hero to us all. In the healing section of the Circle of Friends, new engraving, Gilbert Baker, his rainbow flag, Changed the world. And Edward A. French, exploration, happiness, peace. There are engravings on boulders. They read May the memories be a comfort and inspiration to all who enter. Chevron. I'll love you forever and a day and a couple of hours more. Michael Henderson, Andre. In memory of our judicial colleagues, Richard C. Fela, Barry Cohn, Robert J. Sandoval, Rand Schrader, and Jason Worth. And the last boulder inscription reads, National Age Memorial Grove, quote, we must continue to work together as a nation to further our progress against this deadly epidemic. And while we do so, we must remember that every person who is living with HIV or AIDS is someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, parent or grandparent. They deserve our respect and they need our love." End quote. Bill Clinton. Let's take just one more moment, surrounded by all these names, to remember all the nameless and forgotten people who lost their lives to HIV AIDS. They too should be present here with us today. Thank you, everyone.